tell me if anybody can identify with this. Pain. Yeah. People are facing painful situations. Storms of life are producing pain, grief, sorrow, and loss. Right? Yep. Failures. Rejections. They're all around us, aren't they? Both past and present. And if you're not going through a storm right now, or you're not going through a, a time, uh, this is to serve notice. You will. <laughs> you will, and it's okay. Yep. And the Lord has you. I can attest that in the future you probably will face a storm or two in your life. And as long as you're on this side of eternity, you're going to come up against some pain. You're going to come up against some grief. And there are times that we will face storms in our stormy walk of faith. And there's a reason for that. You see, God is a God who doesn't let anything go undone. He doesn't let things just go by. He doesn't let our hurts. He doesn't let our celebrations. He doesn't let our joys. He doesn't let our sorrows just stay there and say, okay, I hope you enjoyed it. He uses it all to make that tapestry that he's making in our lives. And so they're allowed for a purpose. The pain that storms produce can be overwhelming. Well, actually, they seem to be overwhelming, but no, it's really overwhelming, right? It doesn't just seem to be overwhelming. It is overwhelming, yeah. all right? Now, let's be honest. If you're like me, you do everything to avoid pain. Yeah. Right? Unless you're sick. <laughs> I mean, unless you're really a sick human being. Right? Most of us I like to do as much as we can to avoid pain, the pain of life. Right? I, I shared with the uh, some of the uh, uh, people this week, I was sharing with uh, uh, some believers that, you know, we, the Lord spoke to me in my, my private time, this, I think it was Tuesday, and um, he said, you preach the cross, and many preach the cross so that people will get saved, but many stop preaching the cross after salvation and don't tell people to pick it up and carry it. And I said, you know, that's true, Lord. You know, how many times do we hear pastors preaching, pick up your cross and follow me? Right? How many times do we hear that? How many times do we hear that from, from I don't care who it is that's preaching, I don't care what radio station or what TV station they're on, how many times do you hear about a, a, a life that is, uh, the, the, this, this life that I've never lived in in Christ, that people are talking that you're supposed to be living in if you're a true Christian, that you're supposed to somehow be on the mountaintop every single day, that there's no valleys in your life, right? There's never, there's never any pain in your life. You've never lost anybody in your life, right? Nobody's ever died on you and nobody's dying in your life, right? Nobody's ever uh, left you, right? Nobody's ever divorced. Nobody's ever gone through any pain who's a Christian because once you come saved, Jesus makes everything so much better. You're always up on a mountaintop and you just all you got to do now is just sit and wait for that cloud to come by with your harp on it and so that you can have lemonade and bonbons, right? Yeah, yeah. Where's that? Yeah, where's that? But that's the gospel that's being preached today. I hate to say it, but it's true. Not in all churches, I'll say that. I will say there are still churches, there are still those, you know, Elijah sat down after Jezebel made her decree that she was going to kill him, and he said, man, I'm the only one left, and God said, stand up, you little twerp, there's 7,000 of you left that have not bowed the knee to Baal. So I know that there is a remnant that God has of pastors and preachers and churches, big and small, medium size, whatever size, where that gospel is still being preached, that Jesus is the only way, yes, but not only that, but that you must pick up your cross and follow after him. Now, I don't know about you, but I think the cross was pretty painful to Jesus. Right. Yeah. Do you expect it to be less painful to you? No. no. And why is the cross there? It's to get rid of the fleshly tendencies that we have that get in the way of us knowing and enjoying the presence of the Lord. So that's why storms come. That's why pain comes. We do everything to avoid it, but yet the Lord, you know, why are we living sacrifices? Because we can get off the altar. <laughs> We like being living sacrifice. When we're on the altar, it's too painful. Being a living sacrifice says, I'm going to get up and move over here. <laughs> right? So, when the gale winds start blowing up against your life and there's stormy rough waters are there uh, battering your vessel, we, we try to avoid those tidal waves. But guess what? You know the tidal waves of life. There's physical pain. There's chronic pain. Some people live with chronic pain and chronic sickness. You have marital discord. You have challenging economic times. 
You have failures that you struggle with, past failures that the enemy keeps reminding you of. And sometimes it's not just the enemy reminding you of you. Uh, it, it's sometimes you need to be reminded so that you can know that, see what God has done for you. Amen. Sometimes you need to say, oh, look how God's got me through. How about the rejections of your life? Ever been rejected? Right? You ever been rejected by a boss, by a spouse, by a partner, by, by somebody in your life that meant something to you or you thought was you had a good relationship with? How about fears and anxiety, depression and discouragement? It's all around us. These things are what our text are going to speak to us about this morning. Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 32 says, Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten, beaten by the waves. For the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered and said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come onto the water. And then if you go to verse uh, uh, 30, it says, But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. That's Peter. And he began sinking. He cried, said, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand, took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And as soon as they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And the boat, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Now go to uh, Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 through 27. A very similar story. And here's what's incredible. The reason I read that story is because I want to read this one, because this one makes me laugh. Okay? Look at 23 of chapter 8. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But he was asleep. So Jesus is in the boat this time. He's sleeping. Mm -hmm. I heard a famous preacher say, you see, Jesus truly wasn't fully God, because God never sleeps. And I said, that was his humanity sleeping, not his spiritual man. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes. Oh, I'm sorry, I went up on my back. And they went and they woke up, they woke him up saying, save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said, why are you afraid? Now, why did I read the first story first? Because I wanted you to see that wasn't the first time. Did you see the reaction in chapter 14? They had already gone through it before in chapter 8. Yeah. Now, th th those aren't chapters literally in their lives. They're probably, they could have been weeks or months in between the two. But think about it. Do we tend to react the same way when a storm hits us? Yeah. Well, yeah. Oh, we're going to get a little close today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> huh? And if we do, why? Is it a lack of faith? Lack of trust? I think it's that, but I also think it's this. I think it's a lack of understanding why it's even come in the first place. I thank God, you, you know, <laughs> the journey that I've been on has been so great that even with what the enemy is trying to bring against me in my household right now, in this church, really, because it can strike the shepherd, the sheep will scatter is so almost comical even though it's painful because I realize that we have the same responses sometimes every time we go through the same type of pain. Right? Wives, if your husband has a cold, how does he normally react? Like a little boy. I'm sick. Okay, can I have some soup? Hey, can I, uh, can you make this for me? Right? Stop being a baby. We've been married 40 years and you still act like a little baby. None of your husbands do that, I know. It's just me. But notice both of these scenes. They've encountered this before and they're still reacting the same way. 
that says something about who they are. And I want to say something that might be a little painful right now to hear, but it's very true. If you always react in a way that is un in an uncomfortable situation, in a way like it, that is negative, we need to find out why. You need to find out why. Because what it's going to do, it's going to continue to stall your growth if you don't put yourself in a place of understanding, why do I always react with this type of statement or with this type of anger or this type of, uh, you know, just reaction? Why do I do it? Why, when the, when, the, when the gales of the winds are blowing against me and the storms of life come against me, why is my first reaction to leave? Or why is my first reaction to run or why is my first reaction this this or this always negative ones right you know when you do marriage counseling and you've done as much as I've done in my career as a pastor and, and, and you, you realize that you have to you're saying one thing I'll say to, to couples all the time is you have to shut down the back door wherever you're running out the back door of this relationship shut it down whether it's you're saying, I want a divorce, I want a separation, I, I want to split up. Those type of things got to stop because if that reaction continues to be in your marriage, the enemy will let that thing fester and grow and pretty soon that relationship will be over. You got to board up the back doors. You got to shut them down, maybe even put some bricks up so that there's no way out. Right? In, in, in both of the cases, the Bible says that there's a windy blast against these vessels. We have a and here's the cool part, right? <laughs> Bruce is a fisherman, a true fisherman, I, I, I would say. He's even handed it down to his son. His son just came back from a whirlwind trip, thankfully, and mom's happy again. <laughs> He's a fisherman. These guys were fishermen. They understood the seas or the waters better than probably anybody, right? They understood the vessel they were in. They understood everything. They probably, they probably were even making sure that it was seaworthy, if you will. These are a group of guys who knew the sea. I'm sure that they had storms in the ocean before or in the waters or in the seas that they were in. I'm sure this wasn't the first time. In a boat which was familiar to them. And our text says that Jesus was in the boat with one of them. The other text says he wasn't in the boat yet. And the Bible says in, 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 the, in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 8, it says there arose a great storm in the sea. Now, I love the Greek word for this word storm. You know what it means? It's the word seismos, which is the word, root word for seismograph, which means it was an earthquake. It wasn't just some rain and wind blowing. It was literally earthquake shaking type of storm. That's the literal Greek t translation of what was going on in, in Matthew 8. You ever had that type of storm? You ever had that type of situation in your life where everything in your being was being shaken? Yeah. How'd it feel? It didn't feel good, does it? The thought here is that Matthew was saying that this was no normal storm. This was an earth-shaking, earth-shattering storm. So sometimes when we, when we diss a little bit on the apostles and the disciples for being scaredy cats out on the sea that night, understand this was no regular storm. This was something that was shaking and rocking their lives to the core. They literally thought they were going to perish that night had it not been for the Lord. We'll return to that thought later. We see another type of storm that's in chapter 14. The Bible says it was battered. The vessel was battered. Well, there's another Greek word here for that, and that literally means to be tormented. The word battered there in the Greek literally means it was being tormented. Have you ever been, in, again, maybe I'm the only one here, but have you ever been in a situation where you felt like everything was shaking, rattling, and rolling, and you felt tormented? You just felt tormented. Oh, not like Job tormented where you had boils on you and all that, and you were gonna, you know, taking pieces of clay and trying to get them off you. 
But you know what I'm talking about. Where your world seems shaken. Where everything around you seems like it's falling apart. Have you ever been tortured by Satan's lies? Tormented? Have you ever been tormented by his accusations? False or real? Deceit? Somebody lying about you? All of that's tormenting, isn't it? Have you ever faced a storm in which your faith had been so shaken and challenged and battered and tried? You wondered if you were going to get on the other side of it. You ever been there? Yeah. All right, good. Because pain, sorrow, grief, loss, bad, is all battering in our lives. And it's all meant to help us grow up. It's all help, meant to help us grow up. Why? It's help us grow up mature in our spirit realm so that we don't depend on ourselves. But we become totally dependent on the Lord. The Lord, if you decide to go through the emotionally healthy spirituality course, you will find that there will be a point in it that the Lord will require you, not the course, but the Lord will require you to take an inventory of your past pain. And what's beautiful about that is I've been able, as I shared last week on one result that I had, I've been doing an inventory and I see now where the Lord has used some of my losses, my grief, my sorrow, my painful experiences to make me the man of God that I am today. And some of those I had to repeat, by the way, because my reactions were not the right reactions. <laughs> I'm sure you haven't ever had to do a test over. <laughs> the inventory is, 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 is startling because it's not meant to do anything but to let you see how God uses your life. The Lord, I'm going to say something to you. I share things openly more because of my journey, so I want you to see where I'm at. The Lord said to me this week, I'm here to reduce you to nothing in your own eyes. I don't want you to be dependent upon yourself. I don't want you to think of yourself as anything but other than you are my child and I'm your father. I don't want you to get outside of that realm. Because in there is everything you need. I love that about God. Because he is reducing me. He's reducing me more and more to realizing that I am powerless. I am powerless. And I, I actually am finding great joy in that. Because now it means I don't have to fix everything and I don't have to be everything. All I have to be is with Him and He'll give me the wisdom, the strength, and the grace, and the mercy, right? And so the Lord is showing me that, and the Lord is showing me that. And so I'm going to give you an inventory that I took this week. Can I share it with you? Sure. All right. I'm good anyway, you're right. <laughs> I asked permission because I don't know, it might be too deep. I don't know. So my mom passed away in 2012, and I'm the pastor of the family. Oh, I get to grieve, but I don't get to grieve like everybody else does. I have to grieve in private. I had to go into my, my bedroom in my mom and dad's house and cry alone because I felt like my family needed me to be strong. Now, you might say, well, you know, you're a mature Christian, am I? Why? Because I felt like I had to control my emotions so much I could not share that with other people. I had to feel like I had to be in control of absolutely everything during that time to the point where the funeral director said to my wife, said to my cousin, and said to me, when are you going to break? Because you have been carrying everybody else. My dad died two, three years ago next month, same thing. My, my uncle died six weeks after that. I went back to Detroit, same thing. We were going through a family crisis at the time. I announced the family crisis. Everybody's like, man, you've been carrying all this on your own. And I was. I was carrying a lot. And the Lord began to show me. He said, I want you to be human. I want you to feel the grief and the loss. It's okay. And as I began, to, not, not that I began to start crying or anything, but I began to realize it's okay to be human. Because Jesus was human. Did you know that? <laughs> he never will discard anything. God will never discard anything that's happened in my life. And I realized something. I am more in touch with my grief, my loss, 
I'm more in touch with that in a healthier way today that I actually have even more joy today because I've been able to tap into it and not feel like I have to be this strong person all the time. He said, well, pastor, you know, I want a strong leader. Well, if you want a strong leader, then find a leader who's been broken and reduced to ashes. And that will be a strong leader because he'll know how to identify you when you're being reduced and you're sitting in ashes. We tell people that all the time when people are moving out of state. We've told them this for many years, Susanna and I. We have let them know. We said, listen, if you're, you know, Pastor, what kind of church should I look for? Is it four square? Assemblies of God? What kind of church should I look for? What kind of leader should I look for? You know, da da da. I said, listen, go find somebody. Go find a pastor. Get six pastors. Take them all out to lunch. And the one who's been broken the most, the one who can identify with you the most, is the one you want to lead you the most. The one who says they have it all together, run away from them because they don't. <laughs> and if they say they do, bless them and move on. <laughs> Ever been tormented? I love what Eugene Patterson says. He says, we don't become mature human beings by getting lucky or cleverly circumventing loss. And certainly not by avoidance and distraction of pain. <laughs> Did you, did you know that the Bible says that Jesus learned how to be mature by the things he suffered? Hebrews tells us that. You know what I love about the scriptures? <laughs> do you ever see Jesus telling the disciples to row harder? <laughs> I mean, do you ever see, do you hear Roll harder! Hurry! We're going through the storm! Roll all the harder! No. You know why? What is Jesus doing in one of them? He's sleeping. Why is he sleeping? Because he's trying to model something for us. He's resting in the Father. He's got so much confidence in the Father, he doesn't care where the ship is going, where the boat is going, where the vessel is going. He knows that God is in control of all things, no matter how it looks right now and how dark and bleak, and no matter how much is shaking, no matter how much torment is going on right now, he's trying to model something to us in his humanity. God's got this. Amen. Amen. And that Jesus is the person, he is our Sabbath day rest. Not Sunday. Sunday's a day. It's only one day a week. You only get one day to rest? No. Jesus wants to reduce us to a point where we're so resting upon him and within him that every day becomes a rest. That every day becomes a place that we're operating from a place of rest. Even when we're being tormented and battered around and the storms are raging. He's modeling something for us. He's modeling how to rest, how to come. You know, you remember that commercial that uh, was a, a nesting commercial where they would drink it and fall backwards into the into the pool, right? Just falling back into that ease, right? He wants us just to come and, and fall back. He's modeling how to rest. He's saying to us, you can rest in me and be rest assured as my child that no matter what you're going through, first, I'm not going to waste it. Secondly, this is going to grow you up. But thirdly and most importantly, I want you just to come and rest in me. Why is it that we think that when life becomes harder, we have to row more? Well, maybe if I do more, God will just, he'll finally, maybe if I do this more, or maybe if I do that more, or maybe if I just keep so busy, I don't have to worry about my grief, I don't have to worry about my loss, I don't have to worry about this pain, I don't have to worry about my failure, I don't have to worry about my rejection, if I just keep myself busy enough. Ever been there? That's our culture. Why didn't Jesus say, roll harder? Why didn't he stand, is it, what's the front of the boat called? The bow. The bow and go, row harder, yeah. row harder, we're going to get through it. <laughs> Why didn't he say, everybody take a Jonah dive and get out of the boat. I got a bunch of fish down there waiting to get you. 
Why? Because the Lord isn't asking us to row harder. When we're in the midst of the storm, He's asking us to surrender to Him. He's asking us to surrender in the presence. I told you about my drowning story in Puerto Rico the first time I ever went. I was snorkeling, and we were at a boat, uh, um, crash boat, which is, is the surfing beach of the island. It's, it's world-renowned. It's like the uh, going to Hawaii to surf. It's really awesome. And they have these tow ropes, just like the rope we have over here to keep people from coming down the middle aisle during our services. And, and I was told, don't go underneath that. And I didn't mean to, but the current was taking me, and I was snorkeling. And I was, uh, I, I was, I've been a pretty good snorkeler in my life. I, I like to dive. I've never done any scuba, but I've done a lot of snorkeling. And, and so the current took me up and it took me beyond. And it got so bad that I, I I got up and I saw it and it, the wave, first wave took off my mask. It was so powerful. And then I realized, uh oh, you in trouble. <laughs> and so I see wave after wave after wave coming. And I'm, and I'm, I'm taking it in water. And I'm taking it in water. I realized the only th one of the things I needed to do was release myself from my, my fins. So I took off my, my fins and I took those off real quick. And just as I'm fighting and fighting harder, and I'm fighting harder, I did not know that my wife was on the beach screaming for somebody to get to me. And I mean, I'm talking a ways out. We're not talking like for me to, to the soundboard way. We're talking about a long way out there. We're talking probably 200 yards. She's screaming. I found out she was screaming, screaming, screaming. All of a sudden, this most euphoric feeling came over me. And I just surrendered. And I began to feel the greatest peace I'd ever felt in my life to this day. I was drowning. I was going under. And I was at peace with it. And all of a sudden, a hand came down. It was a surfer. Pulled me up. Blah, water coming out on his board like this and all that. I surrendered to it. They say that people who drown, that's what they do. They eventually surrender to it. It's, it was euphoric. I can't even tell you. I, you know, I can't say I saw a bright light and saw Jesus going... You shouldn't have gone under the rope. You know? <laughs> it was nothing like that. Yeah, come on. <laughs> Think about this. How would you like to hear these words when you're in the midst of a storm? Are you tired? Worn out? Burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. You can hear those words every day, Matthew 11, 28-30. Another way to say it is, are you tired of rowing? Worn out from the gale winds beating against your vessel? Burned out on religion, the religious statements that people bring to you that think they're going to bring you victory? Come to me in the midst of your storm. Get away with me. Rest in me. And you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest when the storm is tossing you back and forth. Walk with me and work with me and watch how I do it. Keep company with me, rest in me, and you'll learn how to live freely. Nowhere in the scriptures does Jesus say, try harder. No. Nowhere does he say, roll the more harder. Jesus tells us if we come to him, he will show us how to rest even in the midst of the storm. Jesus modeled for us that what circumstances we might find ourselves in, our rest is in Him. It could be a failure, a rejection, heartache, it could be pain, it could be sorrows, it could be grief, it could be anything good. God uses them all to mold us and to shape us. Most importantly, to mature us. Jesus never, ever in the Scripture minimized grief. He exemplified it. Jesus never minimized agony. How about the garden scene? You think that was an agony place for him? So much that he was dripping droplets of blood, and he even said, My soul is grief unto death. Jesus never minimized pain. 
If you would have asked him when he was on the cross, he wouldn't have said, oh, this doesn't hurt much. He never minimized anger. You know what he did with all of that and more? He felt it all in his humanity. So what makes you think you have to be superhuman that you can't be vulnerable enough to show your humanity when you're going through it? I'll tell you what it is. Lean in. I'm going to tell you exactly what it is. It's real easy. You're all going to hate it, but it's true. It's called two things, pride and ego. I got to look like I have it all together. It's called a facade. It's called a lie. I got to feel like I'm in control. You got no control. You can control yourself, yeah, but you really don't have any control outside of that. How'd you do with the weather today? Did you control it? You can control the ter- thermostat in your house and the heat, but that's about it. You can't control those, those things that are really life-changing so much uh, that's outside of you. But why is it that we feel like we have to be superhuman? Because we have been told in the gospel message of the past 60 years that somehow you have to be superhuman now as a Christian. And if you're not, and your faith is lacking, so stop it and get a stiff upper Christian lip and move on. Chip, chip. Yeah, you don't have enough faith. You don't have enough faith. You don't have enough moxie. And maybe you just aren't really serving the Lord at the highest levels. Because us who are serving the Lord, we go through pain, but nobody sees it. Because it deflects off of our armor. My armor's never been dinged. Do you have any dinged up armor? I have to keep taking the shield of faith and getting it turned in so that it can be buffed out. Never did he say that you should not mourn or grieve or hurt or feel rejected. Matter of fact, what was Jesus? All of that. He knows you're going to suffer. Life happens. When Jesus... With him, he felt, he mourned, he cried, he labored, he grieved, he was rejected. I don't know if you know that, but he was rejected. Not just that before the cross. He was rejected even in his ministry when they called him a bastard child. When they said that he was born in, of illegitimate birth because his mom was pregnant before they got married. Yeah. He was rejected. Imagine the rejection that he got. He was even told that he was the son of Satan. And he felt it all. He allowed the Father to use it to continue to mature him. And the Bible says in Hebrews, he learned discipline or maturity, the word is there, by the things that he suffered. Not by being God in the flesh. I'm here to just skateboard by life and surf through it and show you how to do it. No. The Bible says he grieved. He grieved over Lazarus. I'm sure as a human prior to his story coming and unfolding to us, when Joseph, his father, died, I'm sure he mourned. I'm sure he grieved. It's okay to feel. Turn to somebody and say, it's okay to feel. Amen. It's okay to be human. It's okay to cry. It's okay to to laugh. It's okay to rejoice. It's also okay to sit there and go, oh my, this hurts. I have found that my prayer life has become far more. And I always thought my prayer life with God was, was very open. But I have found that I am very raw with God now. He hears it all. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Because I've let him go into the darkest part of my life. I've let him in to a... And I, he's been, and it was funny because when I started this again, the Lord said, you know what? I've been waiting to do this with you for so long. To take this journey. I didn't want you to do it alone. I wanted to be with you. Because he went into the darkest parts of my soul. Where I had forgotten why I was doing what I was doing. And why I reacted the way I did. And he began to show them to me. And I began to go, man, now I get it. Thank you. That wasn't wasted. I'm still standing. Amen. Amen. You know that song? I'm still standing. I'm, I'm 
here today, not because of me. I didn't do anything to be standing here today. He got me through it. He walked me through it. He walked me through the storm. He walked me through the battering, the torment, the, the pain, the earthquakes, the losses. He's, he walked me through some highlights in my life too. There's some highlights in my life that he's walked me through. But I've noticed that those weren't as long. <laughs> Come on. Come on. Come on. All right. They weren't as long as the pain. If we as Christians could embrace the cross and understand that it's not going to be painless, but there's going to be some pain involved, there's going to be some loss involved. The greatest loss that I'm finding is I'm losing Eric Dorman in this. And I'm finding Jesus alive in me more places than I've ever found him. Because Eric Dorman is dying. And sometimes it's a slow death because I'm like, no, 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 let's not go there today. Can, can we come back to the light? And Jesus says, no, let's go back in. I'm with you. We're, we're going to do this together, kid. We're going to go into the darkest recesses where no man's gone before. Right? We all know the, the beautiful story of the hymn, but it's got to be repeated. It is well with my soul. Imagine, imagine how that, that, that hymn was written. Horatio Spatford. What's he do? He sends his wife and, and children, three daughters, ahead of him to go over to, to see Dwight L. Moody preach in England. Greatest, probably evangelist at that time, maybe in the world, some say even above Billy Graham. And, and he sends them because there was a great Chicago fire. He had just, by the way, he had, he had lost a son to sickness. There was a great Chicago fire. He lost his holdings, his buildings that he had had. He was a businessman. And just at the time they were going to set sail to go over to England to see D.L. Moody, one of their friends and great, great evangelists, they, they, he gets this call, so to speak, that he needs to stay back because all the fire destroyed these records and these boundary lines. They had to reconfigure who owned what. So he sends his wife and three daughters. How many go? Four. And so he gets there and on the other side uh, 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 when they get to England or when the, 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 those who get to England from that ship, the wife alone arrives in England because the ship that she was on went down. And all three daughters perished. And the only thing on the telegram said, survived alone. So he hops on a ship and he goes the same exact way to London. And when he gets to the spot where the ship went down, the captain came and got him. And he wrote the words, When peace like a river attends my way, and when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, you have taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. At the spot that his three daughters perished. At the spot that his three daughters. He lost a son in Chicago. Now he's childless. And he pens the words. And then he says, though Satan would buffet. Satan would buffet me. It is well. It is well with my soul. And when we can stand at the bow of a ship, and that ship represents pain, and that ship represents grief, and that ship represents sorrow, and you can say, Oh, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul, it is well.
but she can only get there. And I believe Horatio Spafford reading his story. You can only get there when you re realize you have no control and you've come to a place of just total rest in the providence, the sovereignty of God. I don't think he probably, I wasn't there, I can't say, but being human, I'm sure he didn't pen those without tears. Those words. And when you can stand at the bow of your ship that's being tormented, when you can stand at the bow of your ship that's being tossed, and the earth and the, everything's quaking around you, and when you can... When you can stand at that bow and it represents pain, grief, loss, rejection, failure, or whatever you want to fit in there, and you can just say, it is well with my soul. I trust that you know what's best for me. And what I have found is... <laughs> I've had to say to the Lord recently, I'm not going to run away from this pain. I'll sit in it until you are done doing what you are doing. And what I have found is it's true. He becomes your rest at that point because you're totally surrendered. You're totally surrendered. It's so freeing to know that I don't have to fix everybody. It's so freeing to know that I can live openly. I can live honestly. I can tell you when something hurts instead of saying, oh, it's okay. No, it hurts, man. It stinks. One of our friends who passed on, who was in the ministry, one of the first female pastors in all of New England for Foursquare, she used to say, this rots. This hurts. It really rots. And I remember her talking about it. And you know what? I just think, let's just be, let's just be open to the Lord because you know, there's nothing that you're hiding from Him. You might be think you're hiding from Him, but guess what? You're not hiding anything from Him. So when you're saying to, to yourself I'm okay uh, I gotta close with this my dad what a great dude whenever you talk to him no matter what he was going through he always had the saying dad how you doing I feel like a tiger it's on his tombstone actually on his stone at the veterans uh, memorial there in Michigan Great Lakes Cemetery his name and what his rank was in the military and it says I feel like a tiger and I was glad that my sister did that and had that put on there that was awesome but I remember times I knew he wasn't feeling well I could see it in him I could see that he was weakening how you doing dad I feel like a tiger yeah. and so I started doing that in my house and the girls were like stop <laughs> You're not him. And I said, no. But you know, I also found out that I don't always have to say I feel like a tiger when I feel like I'm just, I'm just here, man. I'm just getting through it. How about you? Well, I'm blessed and highly favored. Well, so am I. <laughs> but I'm not going to with you, you know. You know what that type of stuff can do? It can make you feel like you're a second-class Christian when you're trying to live a real life. Well, man, maybe I'm not as blessed and highly favored because I'm not going around with this boisterous megaphone telling everybody. Can we just be real with each other? Can we just be real with each other and be human? And just say, you know what? I'm surrendered to the Lord. I'm going through a lot right now, but guess what? God's got me in this and I'm good it is well with my soul because I don't think this is going to kill me it's going to kill something in me something's going to die in me but 
I don't think it's going to kill me, the person, yet. The human form here. So I'm okay with that. And then I got to tell you one last testimony. I had to make. I had to take a. I had to take a major test. Be certified in a new tool that we're using at work for diagnosing people. And uh, I got the word the other day that I failed it. And I smiled. I said, thank you, Lord. Because now, one, I don't have to do it. But I had to retake the test. But I just smiled. And I thanked the Lord. And I said, because... It was just another chip at my pride, another chip at my ego, to be able to say, it's all good, man. I'm still employed, I'm still breathing, and I'm not a failure. I just failed a test. Eight months ago, I'd have been like, <laughs> I'd have been grieving. I'd have been like, oh God, I'm so stupid. You moron. How'd you miss it? I only missed about like two points. When I take it again, I know where I'll... Okay, here it is. It's the same test. <laughs> it's okay to fail. You might have felt stupid like Scrabble with my wife. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, it's all about pride and arrogance. It's all about making sure that everybody thinks that we're okay and all everything's hunky-dory. And it's okay if it is. If it is, it is. And don't lie. Don't say, go around, well, we got to seem super spiritual and be like totally broken. No. But when it's not, it's okay. Yeah. When it's not, it's okay. It's okay for our ego to die. It's okay for the Lord to take just another step to say, I'm reducing you and how you look in your own eyes so that you can see how I look at you and what I want from you. Which means if the pat's loose today, you'll be good with it, right? You'll be able to move right on and go right into tomorrow and not even worry about it. You'll be like, ah, oh, it's a bummer. Okay, that's cool. Some people will go, oh my, oh. I love listening to sports radio after they lose a game because it's like everybody's d done. Tom Brady's falling off and everybody's done and everybody, oh, it's all bad. We're going to, we're doomed. <laughs> But even how we react to those little things. Why? So would you stand with me this morning? How do we apply this word today? How can you apply this to your life? How can you apply uh, a hymn that says, When peace like a river. Oh, I like that river stuff. Attends my way. But when sorrows like sea billows roll. Eh, that's a tough one, Pastor. Well, if it's a tough one, can we pray together then? Because I want I, I want to pray for you that, that when sea billows roll, that it's not so difficult for you to accept the sea billows. But you accept the sea billows as much as you accept the peace like a river. Matter of fact, I believe when we're in the sea billows rolling, his peace is like a river that floods our soul. So I just pray wherever you need to apply this word today. Maybe for you it was a word that almost sounds like, man, it's a downer word. To me, it's an encouraging word. To me, it brings life to me. To me, it brings me hope. To me, it means I'm, I'm in a different place than I was two months ago. And I know there's more pain to come. And I'm okay with that. I know there's more grief to come. Yeah, and I know that I'm going to have to surrender to it. So Lord, I pray that we apply this word where we need to. Holy Spirit, that you will apply it. I don't want to manipulate where you apply it. <laughs> We're done with those days. I'm asking you to do the work in your son and your daughter right now. To show them where they need to apply this word as a a balm in their life right now or maybe just into a compartment of their life that they will store until the time that they need it. I don't know where everybody's at and I'm not here to try to guess where everybody should be or where they are at right now. I'm just asking you right now to apply this word, Holy Spirit, 
and help your sons and your daughters to apply it the way you want them to receive it. So that when they leave from here, that this word will change their lives in the areas that you're asking for them to be changed in. And for this, Lord, we're going to give you praise and glory. Because some people right now need to just surrender to what they're going through and say, take your time, do your work, finish it, Lord. Some people may say, Lord, I want to hide this in my heart until I have to go through this type of thing. Whatever it is, I'll say it is well with my soul. So help us to apply it to where we need it. And help us to grow through it as we, as we grow and as we walk through whatever we're going through right now in Jesus' name. Everybody said?